and backsliding. Proverbs 14, verse 14. Let us hear the word of the Lord. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Amen. May God bless his word to us, and may he write it upon our hearts as we come to hear his will to us. Well, when we began our introductory sermon on backsliding, and as many of you know, we are in this short series on backsliding, we defined backsliding as a willful drifting from Christ, which if left unchecked, leads to apostasy. Backsliding is a willful drifting from Christ, which if left unchecked, leads to apostasy. In that, we saw that backsliding is the opposite of repentance. What repentance is, backsliding is the opposite. For in repentance, we are led to the Lord. We leave our sin, we leave our filth and our uncleanness, and we go back to God. That is what repentance is. And while repentance turns us to Christ, backsliding turns us away from Christ. It turns us away from him. And the the sorrowful thing that we heard last Lord's Day is this, that it is the infirmity of our flesh to be prone to backslide from him. Hosea 11 verse 7, my people are bent to backsliding from me. It is our bent. We are prone to it. It is the pull of our heart to turn away from Christ. But also, Praise God in that introductory sermon. We saw Hosea 14, and he showed us the cure to backsliding, which is the free love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. For those of us who are his children who cry, Abba, Father, from the heart, he has promised to cure our backslidings, to love us freely. And so when we backslide, right, we don't resolve in our own strength to turn back to the Lord. Instead, we take that promise in hand. O Lord, thou hast promised to love me freely. Thou hast promised to heal my backslidings. Will you answer? And will you be faithful to your own promise? We believe he will love us freely as he has promised to and repentance will come. Well, that was last time. Tonight, we want to discover where backsliding begins, which is not outwardly, but rather in the heart. Backslider, long before your brethren notice, long before your brethren notice that there's something wrong with your walk with the Lord, when they notice the coolness in your spirituality, your absence from the means of grace, you no longer speak of the Lord Jesus Christ and everything else seems to consume you, your work and even lawful things of this world. Long before they notice something's up, your heart is already turned away from the Lord. It begins in the heart, long before it manifests outwardly. Our text says that the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Now, we must never forget our religion is a religion of the heart. It's easy to forget, especially sometimes in the Reformed Church where we have a lot of heady doctrines, which are all good and proper and right. We believe these things, and we must, but they ought to affect our heart. They ought to affect our heart. They ought to be leading us closer to Jesus. We worship the way we do. We believe from the scriptures, not because it's a doct- merely a doctrinal proposition, but because we want what pleases God. Our heart is engaged with the Lord, and he says, I want these things. I want you to sing these words. I want you to hear preaching from the word of God. I want you to pray to me. I want you to uh, administer the Lord's Supper in such and such a way. And we say, if this is what God wants, this is what I will give my God freely. I don't ask what I want. I ask, what does God want? And so the backslider begins to backslide because their heart has been drawn away from Jesus Christ. That's undeniable. Every backslider who walks away from the Lord has had their heart ripped away from him first. They might even be quite religious outwardly, but what would Jesus say to them, perhaps? Perhaps he's saying this to you. They profess me with their lips, 
but their heart is far from me. You may profess Christ all the time with your mouth, friends, but what does he say in that text? He wants your heart. He wants your heart to be near to him. He doesn't want the words out of your mouth. He wants your heart. And if your heart is right, the words will be right. Right? But he wants the heart to be near him. That is the formalist. And many a backslider is merely a religious formalist. Depending on the time that we have together, um, not tonight, but I almost feel like I need to preach a whole sermon on formalism because there are many backsliders who are formalists. That's all they are. They'll even show up. Their attendance chart is great. However, their heart is far from Christ. And they're a backslider just as well. The heart of the backslider then is far from Christ, filled with his own ways and not God's ways. And so he must turn from his own ways and back to the ways of the Lord from the heart. And that's what repentance is like. From the heart, returning to the ways of the Lord. Not just with the mouth, not just with the walk, right? You know, there are many who come under church discipline, rightfully so, because of sins that they have committed that are scandalous. And they will even submit to the discipline outwardly. Okay, I'll stop this, I'll stop that, I'll do this, I'll do that, the things that I've neglected. But unless their heart be turned... That's not right with the Lord. You're still not right with the Lord. Your heart must be turned to him. So to cure backsliding and also to prevent it, the heart needs to be addressed. Your heart and mine too is meant to be close to the Lord. You know, the battle of faith is a battle for heart and mind. You know, I was thinking about this even in my time of being alive. You know, America has been involved in all sorts of foreign interventions, um, we can have a discussion of the propriety of that another time. But even, right, the pagans say, the battle for this nation is for the, their hearts and minds, right? We, we want to win their hearts and minds. We don't just want to conquer territory or liberate people. We want their hearts and minds. Well, this is just something that the Lord is very clearly interested in. He wants your heart and he wants your mind as well. So our theme is related to the heart of the backslider and we'll consider it under three heads. First is a heart taken by sin. Second is a heart taken by the world. Third is a heart taken by Christ. Now the first two, and these are on your bulletin, I trust. The first two indicate where the backslider's heart is. And the last heading is the remedy for the backslider to have their heart captivated by Christ. So first, heart taken by sin. In the backslider, you notice that their love for Christ and their love for his body as well have diminished, always. These two are directly connected after all. It makes sense, right? To love Christ is also to love his body. Um, and so what you find is both first and second table have problems when it comes to love. Devotion cease, right? Their devotional time with the Lord is gone in the backslider, and even their associations with the brethren cease which is very interesting as well. You'll notice this in the backslider um, because after all, uh, the savor of Christ's people is Christ himself. And so if they are feeling convicted, if they are backsliding away from the Lord, they're not going to want to be around God's people. I'll have to preach on that another time. They isolate themselves from God's people because uh, they have isolated themselves from Jesus Christ, first and foremost. But their heart is not warm towards Christ. If we are not strong in love for Christ, uh, here's the issue for the heart of the backslider, right? If we're not strong in love for Christ, the issue is not that we are not strong in love, period. The problem is that we are strong in love for other things besides him, right? When our love for Christ cools, um, the heart has to love something and the heart will find things to love. If it not be Jesus, it will love something else. And here's where we pick up this head. One of the most awful things that the backslider loves is sin. One of the primary competitors, and you think of how awful this is, Christian. One of the primary competitors for the heart of the Christian is sin, which Christ hates. That Christ 
has died for and bled for, that Christ was nailed to a tree for. One of the primary competitors for the love of Christ in your life is sin. Now, Jesus said this, right? He said, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Matthew 24, 12. How logical is that? Just think about how logical a statement that is. How did Christ sum up the law of God? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's a summation of the commandments of God. And sin is contrary to that, isn't it? Right? And so to love sin is contrary to loving God. And so because of iniquity and it abounding, the love of many shall wax cold. To love iniquity is to not love God. When we love Jesus, our commitment must be to not love sin. That is a commitment to every Christian. You know, how many Christians can possibly say, many do, I love Jesus, and then they are unrepentant, rank sinners. They'll come and they'll sing their praise go- uh, songs uh, over and over again about how they love Jesus, love Jesus, love Jesus, love Jesus, and then they'll walk out the doors. And I'm not even just saying that psalm singers do the same thing, by the way. And then they'll walk out the door and then they'll just go and commit iniquity. There's no true love there. Our commitment, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know, loving God, if we loved God, it would be such a barrier to sin, wouldn't it? It'd be such a barrier to sin. You know, Augustine famously said this. I want you to think about it. Love God and do what you will. He's not saying Now you get to be an anarchist. Now you get to be a libertarian, right? Do whatever you want. Um, And I mean morally a libertarian. Um, That's not what he's saying. He's saying the love of Christ constrains us. That if we loved him truly, we would not do sin. So the only things we would do are the things that please him. The only things we would do are the things that are agreeable to his will. So if we loved God, the struggle for sin would be put away in many ways. Love God and do what you will. The one who loves God loves what God loves. The one who loves God hates what God hates. Think of it, friends. Love God and do what you will, which is really to say, right? Love God and do what he wills because you love God. Yet the backslider in heart loves their sin And their love for Christ waxes cold. Now, is it not possible to love sin? It is, isn't it? You need to know that, Christian, that it is possible that you can love sin. The backslider starts to cherish and adore sin in their heart, and they they nurture it. It's like they, they have sin as a pet, and they start to feed it, and they start to adore it, and they start to love it. But the thing is, to to not kill sin, to not mortify it, is to love it, in a sense. You don't want to destroy it, right? You don't want to to get rid of it, be rid of it, right? That shows that you love it. Why is it that you cannot get rid of a certain sin, or you don't want to get rid of a certain sin? You know, we know there's a struggle at times with sin. That's all I'm speaking of. But, But there are sometimes pet sins that we cherish. We know that they are wrong, but we won't get rid of them. You love it. You don't want to see it dead, right? That's the problem. You love it over your Redeemer when you say you won't get rid of it. If you're treating it as a pet, loving it and petting it and cherishing it and feeding it, you need to understand that your pet is a serpent. It's a snake. It's a lion. It's going to devour you when it is fully grown. That's how James speaks of sin when it's fully grown. It destroys you. It kills you. It will devour you. It's as though, and here's the expression, you're, um, you're feeding something that will bite the hand that feeds it. That's what you're doing. You are nurturing a love for something that has its only goal is your destruction. That's its only goal is, is to 
try to diminish the glory of God and to destroy those made in God's image. Why do we love sin? Well, let's be honest. The Bible says it gives us a kind of pleasure. Hebrews 11, speaking of Moses, said that Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. We'll talk about that with worldliness later. But for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Sin gives us a bit of pleasure. It's small, it's transitory, but it's like a hit of a drug. And you come back wanting more. That's what sin is like. You start to feed it, and you, well, you start to give in to it. You start to embrace it. It's like, oh, that was a bit pleasurable. And then you want more and more of it. You know, even as I was contemplating sins that we would even consider, even pagans might consider ugly, like the sin of bitterness. How many of you have taken pleasure in bitterness? And you won't let it go. Bitterness starts to feel good, doesn't it? And it comes pleasurable. And you don't want to get rid of it because you're taking a certain kind of satisfaction in it. But it's killing you. It's destroying you is what it's doing, isn't it? But you start to love the bitterness. You start to love it. And you start to despise the notion of forgiveness and mercy and grace even to your enemies. You've fallen in love with sin. But the more sanctified we are, the less pleasure we will find in sin. A key then to the mortification of sin is to make sin revolting to you. You heard this last time. It is deceitful, sin is. The pleasures it promises, it cannot deliver. Backslider, if you were at your most cogent, you would look at the sin that you are indulging in and you would say, look at me now, Has this really brought me any blessing? If you were honest with yourself before the Almighty, if his face before you, you bear open to God, you would have to admit, this has not been good for me. A good meditation, children, and maybe you've seen this kind of thing, is to think on the drug addict. Picture them in your mind after years of addiction. And you see them outwardly wasting and wasting away. And you see them ghoulish, almost inhuman, unable to do anything, but they will do anything. They will sell their body. They will go after anything. They will murder. They will do whatever in order to get the next hit. That is what sin does to you. And that is what you look like spiritually before God when you are that taken up by sin. You become that kind of thing. Now, maybe others can't see it. Maybe you won't see it in the mirror. But that's what your soul has become like. And it's something that ought to keep us away from indulging in sin. It ought to be to us revolting, pathetic, disgusting. Even when the sin seems respectable on some level. Pride, hypocrisy, worldliness, whatever it is. Backslider, sin is defacing you. And it is destroying and devouring you. There are many sins I could rail against that the, un, uh, that the backslider indulges in, brethren. But I think for tonight, what I want to speak of, because it's so connected to love, is that the worst sin, the root sin, is unbelief. Faith and love are so deeply connected in the scripture, right? When love for Jesus grows, faith grows. When faith grows, love for Jesus grows. When faith dims, you can't see him anymore, Peter says, right? And love diminishes. Now these three abide, faith, hope, and charity. A threefold cord, not easily defeated. But if one of these three cords fray, then we are backsliding. Hebrews 3.12 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. This is how departure begins. Unbelief, backsliding. Unbelief is a sin of the first commandment, just like lovelessness. It strikes at the very first commandment, which children, you know, is thou shalt have no other gods before me. 
Now in glory, there's no need for faith, but in this time we need faith, and we need faith to believe in the character of our God. We need faith to remember his commandments are good. We need faith to believe his promises are yea and amen in Christ. The backslider in heart must pray, Lord, I believe these things, help my unbelief. Because the backslider has bought the lie, whether they admit it to themselves or not, that God is not good. That being with God is not good. That his commandments are not lovely. Unbelief uh, unbelief begins to despise God because God, we believe, erroneously is keeping us from the pleasures of sin. This is how it all began in the garden, didn't it? The devil says one thing. God's word says one thing. Eve doesn't believe God. Eve believes the serpent. She doesn't believe in the goodness of God. She doesn't believe in him constraining her to not eat of that fruit for her own good and the good of her posterity. Unbelief begins that backsliding which leads to a rejection of God. She was deceived by sin. The woman was deceived. She backslid away from God and towards the forbidden uh, fruit. So backslider... If there's one thing I know, sin has been deceiving you. You have been deceived. Don't be so proud. You've actually been deceived by sin. Whatever that sin is that you're holding on to that keeps you away from the Lord, you have been deceived. You've been deceived. Sin has been deceiving you so greatly. Its pleasures are transitory. And you know the payment due for sin. Great and terrible misery. Is that not the promise of sin, really, if you got past all of its deception? It promises, God promises, really, that sin's end is misery. But if sin has grabbed your heart, Christ is calling you to return to him, child of God. How long will the pleasure of your sin last? Is it not fleeting? And what comes afterward? Just diagnose yourself if you've been a Christian any length of time backslider. What comes afterward? Guilt, misery, the ruinous effect of your soul. Do you not believe that? Do you not know that? Faith believes this, which leads to a greater love for Christ when you see what sin is. It leads to a greater hatred of sin. When you remember what sin is, how can you love it? How can I love it? Why do you and I give our heart over to sin at points? God said, sin shall not reign over you. Have you ever seen somebody, and maybe it's been a great grief to you, maybe it's even been family members, have you ever seen somebody fall in love with somebody that you know they ought not fall in love with? And you know the effect it will have on them, especially if they be married, and you say, what in the world are they thinking going after this person? Well, that is what it is like when the Lord sees you go after sin. What are you thinking? Why are you being unfaithful to me, who is the fountain of all blessedness and life and love? And why are you going to this this stalker that is called sin? Sin desires to devour you. Sin desires to kill you. It's almost like, and pardon any anything that might be said, that might be perceived as indelicate. It's almost like, right, uh, a husband sees his wife being stalked by a, a, a nasty stalker and she willingly gives herself to him. What are you doing? This, this lover of yours, it, it is going to destroy you as it destroyed Gomer. Backslider, what do you find in sin that is so captivating to you? Honestly, what is so captivating about sin to you? It ought to revolt you. Make it revolting. What would make it so captivating that it would cause you, right? It's not just that you have embraced sin. You're also rejecting Jesus at the same time. What would make sin that lovely to you? that it would cause you to turn from your beloved. No, you need to rekindle first love for Christ, brethren. Faith must lead you to see him. Do you remember what it was like when it first hit you 
that Christ died for your sin. And I don't mean the time that you were converted, but when the Lord really impressed upon you that Christ Jesus died for my sin and its filth and its wickedness and the misery that it caused my Redeemer, when it really struck a chord in your soul that the God of heaven was incarnated so that he could suffer and die for my sin, did you not look upon him and mourn? I think you did. Because the Bible says you would. Did that not grow love in you all the more that this one would do that for me? Though my sin is obnoxious to him, he was made sin for me that I might be made the righteousness of God in him, that he was slain in my place, that all of God's wrath was poured upon the Redeemer. And astonishingly, the Bible says God did that in love for me. And he went to the cross in love for me. And yet I am in love with the thing that he hates and that he died for. This is the kind of love that Jesus wants you to rekindle in him in Revelation 2, 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Thou hast left that love of espousals, that first love that you had for him. And I'll speak something of that in our last heading. But Jesus says he has something against all you backsliders. He has something against you because you have left your first love. You have left him to chase after sin. And so he says, rekindle the love of espousals. Uh, Jer- Jeremiah 2.2, go and cry in the ears, ears of Jerusalem saying, thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals. Backsliders, let me cry in your ears, as the prophet was called to. The Lord says he remembers the love of thy espousals. What it was like when it was you and him. When it was you and him, you in the secret place with him, pouring your heart out to God. You hearing his word with love and faith and adoration. You desiring to walk very near with him. You having full and utmost trust in him. The world couldn't shake you at all. It was just you and the Redeemer. And you had such love that when he said, follow me, you said eagerly, gladly, I will follow you into heaven. And even if you took me to hell, I will follow you there because I love you. He says, rekindle that love. The love you had when the Lord united you to Christ by faith. When the Holy Spirit took your heart and said, here is thy beloved. He is yours. He's a jealous God. His name is Jealous, Exodus 34. He loves you with a godly jealousy, Christian. Backslider, he sees sin in your life as a usurper of his love. I think of how Paul wrote to Corinth as my time ends with you. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, 2 Corinthians 11.2. O backslider, be chaste in heart. Return your heart to Jesus. Think of the love of the Son of God. Think of the blood of the Son of God. Think of how he loved you and gave himself for you. Think of his commitment to love you to the end. Think of him pleading for you now from heaven, before God in heaven above. Why do you love what he hates? Why do you desire what killed him? It will be the love of the Savior that will return you from your backslidings. Don't just try to work it up in you. Hear the word of the Lord and then pray. How did the apostle pray in Ephesians 3? That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Faith and love are bound together there, aren't they? That, here is the prayer continued, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Pray that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Pray that you may know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. When did you last pray something like that? You know, the sad thing is, for many of us, the answer is never. The backslider certainly has not prayed in this way, at least not consistently. We are to pray 
because it's not just a love that you kind of will have transitory feelings here and there. No, this is to be filled with the love of God, meaning that you are filled with God himself. It's a prayer that your heart be filled with Christ himself, that he would dwell in you all the more in love. These are good and bold prayers the apostle lays out. Remember the love of Christ, that greater love can uh, never be known than this and can never be had. When this fallen world of sin is no more and the world has passed away, the love of Christ for you will still endure. When eternity has gone on for trillions and trillions of years, eternity has just begun and his love will still burn hot for you. Never cooling, never diminishing. What an astonishing love that is. Well, time is gone quickly, so I need to move to our second heading. It's not just the love of sin, but also a love of the world that will rob us from Christ, our heart from Christ. Many backsliders have their affections on the world. Let's consider that next, a heart taken by the world. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, here's key, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now there are things in the world not inherently sinful, However, by elevating them above Christ and his kingdom, they become sinful to us. To make money is not inherently sinful. In fact, it's good. But to be consumed by money is sinful. To eat food is not inherently sinful. In fact, it is necessary. But to lust for food, which is gluttony, is sinful. To recreate is not inherently sinful. It is necessary for the body. But to pursue it over the things of God, that is sinful. To love yourself in an appropriate way is not inherently sinful, but pride is sinful. The backslider, this happens so often, especially in our church society, often falls more and more in love with the world. The problem, the danger for you in that is that we often don't remember the Lord's words. And there are these three. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife, a woman whose backslidings became perpetual. There was a woman who loved the world so dearly that when mercy took her by the hand, she said, let me go so that I may look back at my beloved world, Sodom. And so she became a pillar of salt, children, you know that, a permanent monument to perpetual backsliding is what she is. She is an illustration of Jonah 2.8 as one who would forsake their own mercies for the love of the world. The worldly backslider finds that they must consume the world, but in reality, the issue is that the world is consuming their soul. It's the other way around. Because what is the problem when the, world, when the backslider is hungry for the world? Well, the world cannot fill their soul. The whole universe backslider, you need to know this today, The whole universe cannot fill your soul. Everything in creation is insufficient to fill your soul. Absolutely so. That is why so many who make it to the pinnacle of what this world has to offer kill themselves. You know it. Just look at celebrities. They reach the very pinnacle of what this world has to offer, whether it is wealth or fame or women or men. And they can't deal with it. They realize that this world is empty and it cannot fill their soul. And many overdose to escape this grim reality. They come and they say with Solomon, but not with Solomon's faith, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. The backslider has yet to come to that conclusion. But boys and girls, as I've already alluded, the Lord is so good that he has given you the book of Ecclesiastes, that you may know this by faith, to show you all is vanity apart from the Lord. Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun, 
There is one alone and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother. Yet is there no end of all his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. Ecclesiastes 4, 7 through 8. These are the words of the richest and most famous man who lived on the face of the earth at that time. Think of this, friends. I just want you to meditate on it. If you had all that this world had to give, but not God, would you be satisfied? Think on it. If I could have, you know, the problem is that, you know, the devil sort of lures us and the world lures us with little breadcrumbs, right? If I could have this, just this extra piece of the world, then I'll be satisfied, knowing that the breadcrumbs actually lead off a cliff. But if you could look at the end of these things, and you could say, if I had everything that worldly man has desired, if I could have it all as Solomon did, would I be satisfied? The answer is no. That's why billionaires are not satisfied with a billion dollars. More that they can spend in a whole lifetime. Give and give, they say, more and more. This is why men who are titans of industry are not satisfied to remain there. They must take over the world. They think they can have more and enough to satisfy, but they can't. The world blinds our hearts and minds. And it's the lust for the world and the things of this present world that often leads us away from Christ. Many a backslider begins their slide by being consumed with the things of this world. Even lawful things have displaced Jesus to them. And uh, here are some that I've just noticed, even myself can take me from Christ, but certainly in congregations, this congregations, schooling, errands, work, buying and selling, children's activities, sports, hobbies, entertainment, politics. Now, a lot of these things, there's nothing wrong with them in themselves. Many are good. But what happens when our heart is drawn away by them? What happens when we say there is no time for prayer in our life, but we have time for the world? I no longer, I have long since ceased believing backsliders who tell me they don't have time for prayer. I don't believe it's a lie. It's an utter lie because they have time for the world. They just don't have time for God. You know, if our brethren in China and other places of persecution can pray for hours in the morning with each other, you and I can pray for 15 minutes. You know the difference between your brethren in China and your self-backslider? They simply love Jesus more. They depend on him more. They trust him more. They adore him more. He is everything to them. And he has ceased being that to you. They say, let this world go. After all, what has it done but persecute me? I will have Christ in my heart. Worldly backslider, the Lord says, wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Do you hear that? Your labor for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me and eat ye that which is good and let your soul delight in fatness. You know it well from Isaiah 55. Fatness and delight is in Christ and not in the world. Those things that you labor for in this world, they don't satisfy you. They don't. The world and the things of this world will constantly have you running on empty. Solomon knew it. I have felt it myself. Scores of depressed and dead souls know it. What does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul. The Savior has told you in plain terms, and we ignore it, and we say, let me have enough of the world, and let me baptize it a bit with a bit of Christ. You can't do it. It won't be done. He won't let you do it if you are his. God's economy of the soul is far more important for you today than the world's economy. Now, many of you have found worry to be the entry point to backsliding. Worry over the things of this world. And that's caused people to walk away from the Lord. The Lord says, though, 
Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. And here are the key words I think that we miss so often. We stop there, but he says, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Your life, your soul is so much more than these activities and these things. Your life is more than the things of this world backslider. If you're backsliding because of anxiety and worry, fret not. Those who love Christ are always taken care of. That is his promise and his pledge. You may only have a crust of bread in the cupboard, but what is peace with God and the love of Christ worth to you? You will eat, as the proverb says, a dry morsel in peace and love and joy. While a man, think on it this way, backslider, while a man with millions of dollars in the bank is killing himself with sinful pleasure because he just can't take it anymore and he must feel alive in some way. Isn't that a remarkable difference? The love of the world has made millionaires empty. Now let me mention money and that's an unpopular thing, but God has much to say there. God is clear that many backslide and perpetually so because of the love of money. 1 Timothy 6, 10 through 11. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, here's the part, you know, we often memorize the first part, but here's the next part, which some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. I think if you took that whole text in its context, it's a remarkable word to the backslider who has either anxieties over this world and the things of this world or is craving more and more uh, zeros in their bank account. Many worship money, many covet it and even steal for it. But I also wanted to deal with another thing that is scarcely mentioned. When good stewardship turns wicked and becomes uh, an extreme kind of frugality. Now, have you ever thought about that? That an extremity of frugality actually becomes a love of money, doesn't it? That there are people who love money and are extremely frugal. Now, being frugal is a good thing in many ways. But there are some people, even in the Christian church, who will neglect to take care of others, who will neglect to give uh, unto the Lord's work or unto those in need, as we are told to in Ephesians 4, we are to give to those in need. Uh, They'll even neglect their own children at times. And what would uh, cause their children to prosper with a kind of extreme frugality. Um, I won't speak of a word because it would be sadly um, misunderstood in our day and age, but uh, let's call it extreme, extreme frugality in, uh, in a man actually shows, or a woman shows that they actually love money. And they may not love people because they will not use money to bless others or even to bless their own household. That is backsliding as well. And that can lead to apostasy and it shows a worship of mammon. Now, I want you to consider how the Lord deals with competing masters like mammon. He uses the category of love, doesn't he? Matthew 6, 24 and 25. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Love. Love is being shown. It's a competition between the Lord and mammon. But uh, that also takes us to the love of ease in this world, which is a snare that leads to backsliding. Um, And in that, I've talked about wealth. I think I've said enough. But also, (laughs) ease can show itself in wanting the world's approval. Because that'll be easy for you. That will be easy for you. When God's ways clash with the world's ways and there is pushback for it, what will the backslider do? They will side with the world. They will go in the world's direction. When Jesus said in Matthew 24 that the love of many will wax cold, what was the context? 
persecution. The next verse says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, Christ is unpopular. More and more, the real Christ is unpopular. More and more so in this society. More and more backsliders are being revealed because biblical Christianity is not popular. It is unpopular. It is the very opposite of popular today. In a world where we are told to respect a person's personal pronouns, where we are told by even now ministers to attend to transgender and homosexual so-called marriages, we're finding a lot of backsliding. Now here's a man, a man who is well-respected, uh, Alistair Begg, compromising here. The only thing that you can say is the man is backslidden. The danger is even a minister might apostatize if this is left unchecked, and many have. So you must remember that a love of ease in this world is going to be a temptation to cause you to backslide, Christian. And more and more pressure is being put. This is a nerve that the world is pushing on Christians right now to cause you to turn away from the Lord. And it's going to be more and more prevalent, Christian. And you must be more and more aware of it because you're going to be tempted to compromise. But compromise is backsliding. And you remember that the problem with the backslider is it rarely ever ends there. It just continues to slide and slide and slide until one day you have no problem denying Christ entirely. Be aware of what society... This is a real test for us. Many Christians are backsliding because they do not want to be out of step with the world. They don't want a Christianity that is countercultural and that may cause them discomfort and pain in the world, even job loss. Oh, the world knows that today, the best way to deal with Christians in the West is not to put them on the gallows, but to find them, which I think tells you a little bit of what kind of Christianity we have, where we don't want to face job loss. Our forefathers went to be burned at the stake, but we have get queasy thinking I might lose my job for standing for Christ. That's backsliding. We talked about corporate backsliding last time. This is the state of the church, that the church is backslidden this far, where we don't stand boldly in the face of a society that says, I will feed you to the lions unless you cater to my sin. And we do not say, fine, feed me to the lions, but Christ is Lord. And thus saith the Lord. That's how backslidden our churches are, where ministers are saying, well, go to the transgender wedding. Why did Demas apostatize? Another text I've preached to you. Demas hath forsaken me. Why? Having loved this present world. His backsliding turned to apostasy because he loved this present world. There are more Demases today in American society than there have ever been before. Do not be one of them, little flock. Do not backslide in that way. Well, the, there's something else First John warns us of, the pride of life. There are those who love themselves over Christ. They love to speak of themselves. They're rarely interested in the souls of others. They're not much interested in Christ. They have no idea what the baptizer was saying when he said, he must increase and I must decrease. You see it at times, I don't have time to deal with it tonight. In outward manifestations of dress and ostentatious homes and such, they're consumed with the luxuries of this world because they love themselves and they're showy in that way. I'll have to leave that there and treat it another time, but when a Christian is no longer modest, and modesty is not just about covering up the appropriate parts of the body, but it's also in how appropriate we are in showing maybe even our wealth and who we are. And you know, when a person, you, they walk into a place and you're like, I know why they chose that, that dress. They want to express exactly who they are, right? You know, you've met people like that. And that's really the pride of life when they think in such a way as that. Where even you know, coming into the worship of God, they want to draw attention to themselves, right? 
Um, that's somebody who has the pride of life. Another subject for another time, but so many backslide in this way. Now, the world actively is coming after you, and you must know that. It seeks to uh, bring your heart to itself, and you must be on guard concerning that. I'll have to treat that another time. But I also want to warn you that people may take your heart away from Jesus. And this has happened far too many times. A person may take your heart from Christ. Sometimes it's even family members who are unbelievers will take your heart away from Jesus, right? I've seen it in this congregation and outside this congregation where mere men or women will insert themselves between you and Christ. And you will, you will follow the man or the woman over the Lord. You know, your, Christ often tests your loyalty, doesn't he? And he often does that with those nearest to us, even family. He said in Matthew 10, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. You need to think on that. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. What he is saying is sometimes there are people who are close in your life who will be a hindrance to following him. And he says, if you are to follow them over him, you are not worthy of him. That's a solemn thing to think about, that the Redeemer says that. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. You know, I know this painfully as well, that at times to follow Christ will even mean leaving family. And he says, if you won't do it, you are not worthy of him. This is the path that leads to apostasy. And he said this plainly. He tests you. I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. The Lord tests your faith by often pitting family members against you. Now I have been blessed in this congregation to see some of you, even when close kin, right? You know that they're doing something that is wrong and they're tempting you in that way. You have said even to brother or mother, I cannot go with you in this way. Even if we're family, even if we're kin, I praise God for that. But often it goes the other way around. The backslider will not vaunt variance with their family and side with unbelieving family or backslidden family against Christ. But then, most famously and most disturbingly, many backsliders have slidden away by being unequally yoked. This is how Solomon's backslidings began. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father, 1 Kings 11, verse 4. Young people, many of you are going to desire what God says you cannot have in marriage. Whether to an unbeliever, which almost always, by the way, ends up in apostasy, or even unwise marriage matches. You know, a believer who says their children must be baptized because the word of God teaches it starts to court a believer who denies that well, has their mind really been changed on baptism? I'm just using it as an example because it often happens. Was their mind changed on baptism or was it their heart that was taken away? It was their heart that was taken away. And what happens next? Almost invariably, backsliding in doctrine and conviction. You think it ends with baptism. Well, you have clearly said that this person is actually my Lord in some ways because I'm willing to give up conviction for that person. And so you will find yourself with implicit faith in that person or another person. Well, I'll leave that there because we must end soon and go to our final heading, that if our heart is snatched away, we must have Christ reclaim it, um, which is our final heading, a heart taken by Christ. Well, in the Revelation there was a backsliding church at Ephesus. It was quite religious. It knew lots of good things. It taught lots of good things. It contended for the faith with vigor. 
But Jesus saw through the formalism and saw into their hearts that they had become formalists. And uh, perhaps when I treat the fear of God, I'll treat religious formalism then. But he said, uh, he showed us rather, that the cure to backsliding in heart is in his chastisement of Ephesus. I read it before, let me read it again. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Here's the cure. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. He says you have left your first love. That love that you had first of all with him. Those high days of love you had when you were first engaged to be his. And he says the cure has three ingredients. Remember, repent, and do the first works. First, remember from whence thou hast fallen. Again, I'll just bring this back because it's a needful reminder. Remember the days of your espousals to the Lord. He says, do you remember the days of your espousals to me? What it was like when I was on your mind and heart only. When it was just me and you. Remember, believer, how Christ has captivated your heart and mind. You can think back in your history, to those days in which you knew the love and presence and care of the Lord. And if you're backslidden, the one thing I know is that those days are long, long gone away. But he says, remember them. Remember what you were like at the height of your spirituality. Remember how far, right, you have fallen from that. That's what the backslider has done, is not only is it a departure laterally from the Lord, I think maybe it would be better pictured as a dropping off from the Lord, as a falling away from the Lord, not just a moving away, but a falling away, which is why if it is left perpetual, it falls into the pit of hell. But he says, remember, and he says, I can give you back what you have given up. If the fire of love is cooled in your heart, remember who Jesus is. Remember what he has been to you. And remember his unquenchable love for you, backslider. You remember how the Lord warned Cain about sin, that sin is crouching at the door of your soul and its desire is for you. Now that desire is a devouring desire of a horrible sort. It means to destroy you. The same kind of desire a lion has when it licks its chops at you. But in Song of Solomon 7.10, The church says, I am my beloved's and his desire, the same Hebrew word, is for me. Same Hebrew word, two very different meanings. The question is, why has sin and the world taken your heart away from Jesus? In the arms of sin and the world, you find sickness and misery and damnation. And in the arms of Christ, you find peace and joy and nurturing love. And so you're to remember that. I have to be brief in these things because of time. But the second prescription is repentance. Lovelessness for Christ is to be repented of. It is a sin. Don't just treat it as a feeling. It is a sin. It is a sin to not love Christ above all. A first commandment sin. It makes sense that our Lord would say to repent of lovelessness because backsliding is lovelessness and a moving away from the Lord. And so repentance then would bring us back to him in love. In love. And when you do, he says he will love you freely and he will give you grace. And he said to do the first works. And I preached to you on those when I preached on the seven churches. He he says, remember what you did when you first came to me, when you were first espoused to me, but now you no longer do these things. You, you have made a habit of not doing these things, backslider. But you once had a habit of doing these things. I don't know if you ever reflect back on your spiritual life. But Jesus says you must. You must. Remember that first work. I'll give you some of the ones. I won't give you all of them because of time. Remember those works that you first did? Remember that first work of trust? You once trusted Jesus. You put your life in his hands and not in the world's hands. You said, come what may in this world, I will trust him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Come what may, my Lord loves me and will care for me. So I will trust him implicitly and follow him. Then you remember how good it was when you were a student of the word of God. You loved it. You dove into it. 
You, you probably, like a lot of us did in the early stages of our Christian life, brought a bunch of highlighters to highlight our Bible in all kinds of ways because we wanted to devour his word. I'm not making an argument pro or con for highlighting. But you said, this is the voice of my beloved. This is the voice of God. And I love it. And I want to know it. And I want to know him in it. You would devour sermons and you would search them out. It was not the world's entertainment that you searched out, but you would say, what sermon could I listen to? What part of the Bible could I hear? It wasn't just study material to you. It was his voice. Remember from whence you have fallen. And then there was prayer. Every child of God, when the love of the spousals is high, pours out their heart to God in prayer. He wants new intimacy and vulnerability and dependence in prayer. Is there prayerlessness in your life? That's backsliding. The child, I think we heard that this morning as well. The child of God who loves God prays. That sounds simplistic, but it is probably the best gauge. Because there's very little in prayer that can gratify our flesh. It's a dependence on the Lord. If I love Christ, I am drawn to prayer, not prayerless prayer, not praying to yourself, but with a sense of love for the Savior. Friends, if you are too busy with everything else and prayer gets shoved aside, there is little love of the Savior in you. And it is a primary indicator of backsliding. You know, I can tell my wife I love her all that I want, but if I never express any desire to spend time with her and to talk to her, then I am a liar. I am. There's lots of loveless marriages like that. And the love that backsliders espouse to Jesus is something like that. But the grace of Christ can cure it, so go to him in prayer. And then there was a love of worship early on. You loved to worship the Lord. You loved to come to church on the Lord's Day. When service concluded, I remember these days, When the Lord's Day was over, it's almost like you couldn't wait to come back to church seven days from now. Because what else will the Lord teach me and show me of himself? There was some disappointment when service was over. Why has that stopped? Has church really degraded so much? Uh, This is the same church that you have been, uh, if you've been with us for some time. And you remember how it was once like. Every Lord's Day, you loved it. You came here. You enjoyed it. You couldn't wait to sing the word of God and to hear the word of God. But in many backsliders in this congregation, that ceases. The the worship hasn't changed. What's happened? It's your heart has turned from Jesus. And then there was evangelism. You once wanted to tell everybody about Christ. You were like the Samaritan woman who ran to all she knew. Let me tell you of Jesus. And then you showed love to neighbor. I remember... I was so provoked when I was first converted. I would see somebody pulled off to the side of the road and I would make sure I had like water bottles for them in case they needed help. It's just my love, the love of Christ in me just constrained me to love others. And when first love cools, that love goes away too. Remember the first works. Well, time is really gone. But brethren, lots of backsliders profess love for Christ, but Jesus has something to say to them. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Your backslidings will be cured if your heart is restored to him. He is calling you, all of you, to return your heart to him this day, to put away your love of sin and of the world and everything else, to put away mere formality in religion, to draw near with your mouth, and honor him with your lips only. But to keep your heart away from him is a great evil. I fear, I fear that the church, and I'm not just speaking of this church, is so full of backsliders in heart that seem outwardly as Christians, but their heart is far from him. May that be not you, and may that not be me as well. And may Christ capture our hearts this day and put away our backslidings. Amen. Let us arise for prayer, if able.